My name is Richard Shear, and this is Montpelier City Forum, and we're going to be talking about the election, the town meeting day that's coming up, and this is one of our presentations. This is District 1, and we have an incumbent this time. We have Donna Bate, and this is not the first time that we've done this, I think. No, this is our third. This is our third. Donna, for those who do not know you, what part of District 1 do you live in? I live in North Franklin Street, which is near the Lane Shops by the the North Branch. And is it far away from Finch Lane and, uh, <laughs> and rosy as you can get? Not very, actually. <laughs> but uh, it's interesting how sometimes counselors end up living in very similar locations. But we really try to represent the whole district. And as well, I answer people who call me who aren't from my district. I think you should be able to talk to any council person. Boy, talk about District 1. Uh, when I talk about District 2, that's all the way from Murray Hill down to Berry Street. Set the parameters of District well, 1, I mean, please. District 1, I like to think of it as starting out way out the city limits Elm Street, and it comes down and goes across the river just a little bit to get part of North Franklin, Franklin, and then just one half of Main Street comes down and gets one half of State Street <laughs> all the way out past the Dairy Creek. And everything in the, that Pie is District 1. What's the commonality there <laughs> in this gerrymander? <laughs> well, no. Uh, it's counting the bodies and then cutting a pie. You know how sometimes people are very finicky. Well, this was really about body counts. Boy, I have talked to you all the way from when you were candidate Donna Bate running yeah. for city council. What did candidate Donna Bate want to change? That there was a moment when you were not the incumbent. <laughs> That's Take right. Me back to that. It was a moment when I had to decide if I wanted to do it and I wanted and what my platform would be. And literally, uh, at that time, Gwen Hallsmith was very definitely the catalyst. She went out and said to people, "Do you know your council member has never had an opponent?" And that shocked me to feel like a council person. That's true for me or anyone else has never had an opponent. And so I got thinking about if I was on city council, what would be my focus? And number one is to really understand the safety issues for our community, the service issues for our community. And I was very much interested in all the committees and transparency. Are all the committees really transparent? Are there minutes posted? Are there meetings posted? Can people attend them? And I did a, a lot of attending of a lot of committees my first year. And I've year. sat, I've sat, I've had you. And it's phenomenal. In those we have such involvement of our citizens. It's wonderful. It's also hard. Like last night at the council meeting, we had several appointments, and we had more appointments than we had slots. And so you read not just the resume, but where the person is, their involvement. Wasn't it good? Oh, it was wonderful. But it was very hard to say no to the people who were just as qualified because you only had two slots and you had six candidates. We hope they'll all come back when the other slots come up, but it's just, I'm very proud of the level of involvement we have. Now I'll hit residents. you with one that, that's so trivial that you probably won't know. Approximately how many committees and commissions do we have in this city? I, a I, lot. <laughs> it feels like three dozen, but as a, somewhere between two dozen and three committees and commissions. It's amazing. And some are just temporary. It's like we had that short dog committee, or we have a committee to review committees. I was on one of those short yes, committees. You were. I was on the parking committee. Parking committee, yes, you were. And that was very important. You had a group of really intense minds looking at how do we deal with this real estate. And they looked at what we charge at our meters, how we deal with demand management. I mean, there were a lot of things that they dealt with that the council nor the staff had time to dive into. It was because of that committee that we ended up with credit card meters. I well, think that's also great. Also, that committee got rid of the snow ban. Well, y yes, yes. Right. Yep. And uh, I will say. But I must say, of, persistence is what made it work. Oh, absolutely. I will that also was really say. really hard that first that, two years. Uh, the staff really person hard. on that committee was Kevin Casey from yes. Planning, who was an excellent co member of the committee and contributed yep. a great deal. Uh, is there an outside agency that you sit on the board of? Council does has a person on a lot of right. Uh, like I'm the also library. on the regional public Central Vermont Public Safety Authority, and I sit on the Montpelier Transportation Infrastructure Committee. I sit on the Regional Planning Transportation Advisory Group. I definitely have transportation on my brain. Could you talk to us a bit? Because that's a passion 
of yours. It is. And, and a it specialty, is. and you bring that to council. When council gets organized in March, they turn to you and you say, I want transportation <laughs> covered this please, year. Please, please. And, and that's because I feel that transportation is a role model to integrate everything. When you have a vehicle going down the road and you're putting public dollars in it, it should let anyone ride it. But also you have some private vehicles and vans and shuttles and they should be integrated with public transit. Because the more we maximize that vehicle on the road to more services, it's more affordable. Now transportation in your view also includes pedestrian transportation Absolutely. and bicycling? I'm a walker, pedestrians, bikes, uh, even scooters. <laughs> I mean, there has to be a place to, to allow people to have these mobilities, even if some of them are more for fun than getting there, like scooters. Now, I don't want to sit and age you, but you've been in Montpelier <laughs> for a few years 51 now. 51 years, yeah. How is transportation different 51 years ago than it is Just now? Just the whole downtown, the presence, the, it's more attractive, it's more oriented, I think, to pedestrians and getting people out into the streets, the amount of street closures we have now were unheard of when I moved here in the late 60s, unheard of. In terms of transportation, what does the Transportation Committee do in terms of coordinating this? The Transportation Infrastructure Committee came out of having, we had a bike committee, a pedestrian committee, a was parking, a committee. parking committee, <laughs> Energy Committee, we still have the Energy Committee, right. but was integrating these, and just now we're looking at the infrastructure. The Bike Committee was v very much the catalyst for the Montpelier in Motion Plan, and from that... What is the Montpelier in Motion Plan, please? It's a plan looking at all the resources we have now and how can we modify them so there's more room for bikes on the road, more safety for bikes on the road, but also those bike paths, those shared paths. They start out, I think, as a bike path, but we really want them to be shared paths with pedestrians and others so that we have the connection. You can go from one end of town to the next without being on a street if you want to. Now, correct me because this is, you're, a, you're in the in and I'm on the out. Um, I think that the bike path goes all the way to Civic Center starting in 2019. Well, yes, that's the goal. And we have the, we own the real estate, the project is there, and it's just getting it all completed. Yes. How does that relate to uh, some would call the Taylor Street project, some still call it the Carlot project? How does that relate to that project? Well, Taylor Street is in the middle, and we actually have two, three studies going on. So Taylor Street itself is the building and the transit center and developing human access to the river. And then we have Taylor Street itself that is going to be done as a complete street. So you'll have... Wait, how is it an incomplete street right well, now? Well, incomplete right now because it only accommodates cars. So it's... And it's not very attractive. So you would put in sidewalks with protection... Uh, what you call uh, grass protection buffers. You'd have trees. You'd have lanes for bikes. Are we going to replace the bridge there? Or, or uh, oh, no, them? no, no. But the street itself stays two lane, but there's a space there to put in sidewalks, uh, bike uh, accessibility. And likewise, because the transit center brings the buses in and off the road, it won't interfere that it's just such a small street. We were hoping to get a rid of all the wires, but we are going to get, be able to reduce a lot of the overhead wires on that street and really try to make it work for cars, bicyclists, walkers, everybody. <laughs> when do we get the, the pedestrian bridge uh, behind um, where the farmer's market used well, to be? Well, see, and that's part of the extension of one street and the bike path there is going across the pedestrian bridge in behind M&M Redemption. That's being, Which is leaving. That's being moved. We've given them a little extra time, but all of those projects are being breaking earth this spring. So this spring, early summer, that's really good. And the bike path itself, we also have a study that's now looking at Berry Street and Main Street because that's a, a bad connection. You, you, like you have this walkway on the other side of Sarducci's, but that doesn't connect to the other side of the walkway over by Taylor Street. So we want to work to connect those. Was that where they were proposing uh, a, a mini traffic circle? Well, that, that's one of the things they're exploring. At not only a traffic, potential traffic roundabout at Barrie and Maine, but also Maine and State. Once you get one traffic circle, it really works better to have them join together. That traffic light at State and Maine really holds up traffic. 
And if you put a, a traffic circle in state in Maine, although they're going to study it, but this is just my opinion prior to the study and looking at other roundabouts, it would really facilitate movement. It would allow pedestrians to cross more safely, but individually, road by road, so they wouldn't have to wait for the whole five streets to go before it's their turn. A change on council since you've been here has been hmm. an emphasis on infrastructure. And I know that, that you, have, <laughs> you have had your hands in the planning to put more into the streets and more underneath the streets into oh, water and sewer. Underground utilities are just desperate to be upgraded. Can we do that well, realistically and still hold our budget? We're well, only a town of 7,500. The buzzword, the term that the council adopted before I got there was the steady state plan to start putting a certain amount of money aside for streets. And likewise, the staff has gone after grants for utilities. So yes, we're spending money on utilities, but to try to have that grants in place, state and federal, so when we do a street, we can do the underground utilities. I mean, we're pe replacing piping. Some of it is wooden. I mean, that just shocks me. Right, it's, I, I, <laughs> I mean, think that it's some so of it antiquated. Was, I think that our sewer, some of it, and our water is 80 years old, 100 years old? Oh, yes, yes, and uh, yes. So that's really important. But I also feel that we need a steady state plan to support our parks. I feel our parks are underfunded and understaffed. Okay, would you define our parks? People, There's more than Hubbard. It's much more than Hubbard. And more than that, even though I'm in District Street 1, which is on the city's downtown side of the city, I want to get parks across the river. I want the whole city to have parks within a reasonable walking distance, at the very minimum, parks that will accommodate young children. Where would a park across the river in your mind possibly be? I, I'm trying to envision well, where you know, there's green it, land that, that you could deal with a park. Well, you know, it's interesting, although I don't think it will happen because it's too valuable real don't estate. Don't worry, everybody can keep this <laughs> secret. <laughs> well, you know, there's skiing right now and walking being done in a, all that woods up off of Northfield Street. If you go across right, the right. Econo Lodge and the houses there, there's a common area of woods that people and walk And there's the woods that go in. up to National Life. Yes, so I think on either side, you could put an accommodation of an area with benches and just s small things that kids would, that are toddlers would be safe to play. I'd like to see, you know, we're doing a lot of public art. I'd like to see more public art that kids can climb on. Well, you can climb on the <laughs> rubble that used to be at the Econo Lodge. Well, right, I mean, who knows? The Econo Lodge may end up to be some very, very creative spot um, because I think something needs to go in there that really is green and pretty and inviting for us to be. In District 2, Sabin's Pasture. Yeah. What, what is the fate of Sabin's? We're going through all these projects that started <laughs> over a decade ago. Boy, we're covering a, a yes, well, Sabin's Pastures, I feel, was on the cusp of uh, the Zorzi family moving forward with some level of development and partnership. And I think it may get there, but there's some bumps with the most recent zoning. Uh, we spent so? a lot of time with zoning, and we know that at this given time we made decisions, and it's in the paper. It's on the final print of zoning. But it's not in concrete. It's on paper. So I do think that we're going to be relooking because the parts of um, Saban's Pasture that the city council, which I disagreed with, uh, made the lower part we dealt with for density, so you could put housing in there, both for the Vermont College, uh, excuse me, <laughs> Vermont College of Fine Arts property mm -hmm. down by Berry Street, as well as the Savings Pasture area down by Berry Street. But the council majority voted to make the upper part rural. And that made the value of the land less. So when the Zorzi family went to the land trust, because they were going to be trying to make a partnership there, it, it made it less valuable. And my understanding is, as Orsi family at this point said, no, we can't do that now. But I think if we do some tweaking with how we zone the upper meadow, I think we'll have the Orsi family back on board and we'll be able to move forward to get that land reserved for public use. In a town that's notorious as a NIMBY town, not in my backyard. <laughs> oh, we've do made progress, Do you think we could get a, a, a consensus progress. to loosen up on, on that, um, that upper bowl? We've, I think, you know, people are really looking at, okay, we say we want more density. I mean, we're, we're the little city in our region. And so we need to look not only at downtown development and increasing density, density, but in filling in other 
portions and looking at houses that are a little different than what's there. And also not saying that you can't have multi um, dwellings outside of downtown. I think we have to look at more diversity and fairness of our zoning. So that downtown, if you're low income, you have to be downtown. There should be choices of housing up on the hill as well. Now, the um, development that we're doing for the, um, the, the brewery, the distillery, I'm sorry. Yes, Cavastone. Now, Spirits. some of that would logically feed towards helping Savings Pasture, yes? Well, yes, but that was a separate deal, and we worked with the Zordzi family there and the railroad. I mean, there were a lot of moving parts to getting that land and that uh, agreement But extending through. water and the like, it's, yes. not, it's a hop, a skip, and a jump to take it across the street, isn't yes. it? I, is yes. that an investment? It's definitely an investment. And we also, I mean, we had to move some uh, piping. I mean, so it, it's a, an investment that we feel will pay back, not only as a, a tax paying and an employer, but also, they'll be using our water. And we Which we've need, got an abundance well, it's, of. Well, it's one of those things that, you know, you, you do all this economy and the city water usage, when everyone went to low water use toilets, I mean, in one... Particularly National Life. In one month, you got it, of National Life using low water toilets, our water usage went down. Well, the overhead doesn't change. So, unfortunately, our water bills are higher than we would like them. And until we get more water users, it'll stay that way. So this is, I think, is a win-win with Caledonia Spirits. What about, um, let's stay in water, uh, <laughs> the methane project up at the plant. Oh, I think, again, that, that to me is another infrastructure, okay? We have aging, aging operational equipment at our water waste treatment plant. And they've all, a lot of the parts have outlived their expectations. And at any moment, you know, whoops, we're going to have to upgrade them. I mean, replace them. So we can replace them for $6 million, or we can upgrade them so that the plant is producing energy, capturing it, and creating its own electricity, and probably more than it needs, and we can sell electricity. But not only that, but then we can also be such an upgraded facility, we can get more vendors, haulers, bringing their waste in so that it becomes a revenue generator instead of taking. But that's a $9 million investment. So $6 million to stay where you are and just do the replacement, or $9 million replacement, upgrade, and energy, so we're moving towards the net zero. What about the project out on, I, I keep calling it Sumped Up Road <laughs> instead of Finch Drive where Rosie lives, the solar okay. panels out there. What, what's the status on that, that project proposal? Well, we ended up not having solar panels at the dump stump. Why? <laughs> Flinch Road. And that was, once, they, once again, you, have, you look at this land and you and I say, that's an ideal spot. And oftentimes, landfills are, but it turned out that that terrain was so, de uh, would demand so much modification that it w we couldn't financially afford to do it. The vendors couldn't do it. So hence, we now, the city has solar panels, but they're housed somewhere else. So we get credit for them, we invested in them, but they're not on our land. Now, th in the future, again, as solar rays and all that equipment gets better, perhaps we can put some there, but it, what, it wouldn't hold the extensive amount that we initially went, want, wanted to do. Now you spoke of downtown density. Yep. Net Zero's plan that they awarded the $10,000 for, the, the one that had the trams going up to National Life, what were your feelings on that plan? Okay, now you jump to a vision. And I must say, I do like having a vision. And to me, that's what, like the wastewater plant. If we're going to put money in that infrastructure, let's put money where we want it to be. We want it to use less energy, and we want it to produce revenue for itself and the community. So likewise, when you look at all these other facts with infrastructure, oops, I lost my pot. Uh, we were talking about net zero downtown, <laughs> net zero, and, their, downtown. and their vision. Okay, the vision. Oh, sustainable Montpelier. Exactly. Yes. Sustainable Montpelier vision. To me, I want that vision there. So when I'm having to spend money to maintain something, I want to know I'm working towards that vision. So I like the idea of having something unusual like the tram from Mont National Life down. I think, wow, because there's potential land up there for housing and not to increase car usage, but to reduce car usage. I'd love to see the train developed. Way back in the 90s, early 2000s, I was on the Governor's Rail Council. And is it expensive? Yes. 
but trains are a way to get cars out of the road, get rid of construction. So I'm open to seeing what we can do and what we can partnership with. Uh, I'm not saying I'm willing to spend all that money, but I want to talk about it and have it one of our options of discussion. When we talk about aging infrastructure, the recreation center mm -hmm. uh, on Berry Street is a piece, a classic piece of aging infrastructure. Right. What would you do on that one? Well, you see, and that again, when you go back to that sustainable Montpelier competition, and I see how much they brought the river in. I didn't like all, a lot of the um, presenters had buildings right against the river. And one thing that was really good about Tim Bridges, they didn't do the traditional city build up right against the river, but they allowed us to have public access and view of the river. And likewise, I'd like to see a, a center that meets our need for the full age span that the rec department now does and with the seniors, so we have a much more multi-age facility, such as we now have parks, recreation, senior center, under the heading of community services. One place to call, whether you're calling for your kid, yourself, or the grandparents. You know, it's one place to call to make a reservation. I think that's good, and I want the facility to have the same sort of flavor. How much do you think that the town can bond for that sort of See, facility. I, I, right now, I'm not, the, I'm not even looking at that because I'm practical enough to say, that's my vision. We have some proposals in for a feasibility study. Right. And so, wait until the feasibility and study so comes back. You look at what the need is, but I, just my own biases are, one, it needs to be a private, public venture. I think pulling in businesses and business expertise as well as funding. And I think it has to be a real regional service. Now, this is the first time this year that we've actually taken questions in our survey monkey, Orca oh, really? survey monkey, <laughs> of what would you ask the council? And one person wrote in, you cannot interview Donna Bate without asking about dogs. <laughs> okay, dogs. I like dogs. <laughs> Do I own a dog? No, I have a family full of allergies. And I'm sorry that people took my request to put the should dogs be leashed in Hubbard Park on the ballot for last summer because I wanted a pulse, not just of the people who are dog walkers, pro or con in Hubbard Park, but people from all over the city. It is a city park. And indeed, we found that the dog committee was split, what to do with Hubbard Park, other than we wanted to make it... Except for change the name of the dog committee <laughs> to well, something like the canine oh, committee. Or the something. canine committee. I mean, there was definitely some progress with the last few years of the park commission with their canine code of conduct. Is that being followed? Well, it's a good step. I think it just needs more education, more promotion. But back to the voting about it, I think the whole city needs to embrace the fact, okay, we have some dog issues, both owners and non-dog owners. Well, how can we work on that? So I strive for more communication, and I'm sorry people felt threatened by it. What we found out that it's about a little more than half said, don't leash them. A little less than half said, please leash them. So it's like, okay, we know we need to make some changes. It doesn't mean extreme changes, but we know we need to make some what changes. What was the dog ordinance that you sponsored and, and that passed? Could okay. you explain well, that simply to people? Okay, well, the dog ordinance wasn't really sponsored by me, but it came out of the dog committee, okay. and what the dog committee decided was that dogs should be leashed on, da on city streets, sidewalks, streets, and shared recreational paths. What are shared and recreational paths? So that was one of the definitions that came up. And it was confusing, so what we added last night was that except for Hubbard Park. And Hubbard Park would be governed by the Canine Code of Conduct unless there's a conflict. And if a dog gets in trouble in Hubbard Park, then they'll go through the same steps of the ordinance of any other dog. What are those steps if a dog gets in trouble? Okay, so first they actually get a warning. Let's say they... The owner gets the warning, not the dog. <laughs> well, yeah, a dog gets a warning. And there's a, but there's very levels, I mean, very clear uh, definitions of what's a dog running at large, what's a dog that's a nuisance, what's a dog that's dangerous, and then there's a... Uh, actual animal control committee, and they have veterinarians on there that have expertise in dog behavior, and so they would really have help in analyzing what is the issue, 
and what was the specific situation circumstances, because that makes a big difference. And so people are not trying to be black and white about this, but they are trying to have clear guidance to help understand all the gray areas. And I just think we're always ahead when we talk more and we get more opinions, not less. So whatever happens in the future, I want people to enjoy all of our parks. I want people to enjoy being downtown because I think having safety is feeling safe from harm but also from harassment. I'm going to hop skip to <laughs> the farmer's market, which is moving okay. to State Street. What's your view on that? I thought that was great. I was a little disappointed that they ended up, I liked that they were all in the middle uh, this summer. But there were lots of uh, functional problems with wiring and safety, and some individuals with different physical disabilities felt it was more unsafe. It was safer to have them with their backs uh, to the sidewalks. So we're going back to the more open kind of uh, venue, and that also meant some better criteria for the fire department, should they have to get in or out. So again, we're, we're talking to one another, we're trying things out. I think it's a good move to bring them up into the community, and I hope that it supports our other businesses. Business development downtown. Uh, as everyone knows who's watching this, my <laughs> wife does own the pet store in yes, town. Yes, yes. What can we do to help our businesses downtown to prosper? And at the end of the day, we still are a town of 7,500, and we're having right. the same small business blues that other towns are having across the country and the competition right. with the internet and the like. Is there anything the city can do? I think one, I think the council has tried to support the downtown businesses with Montpelier Live, with the Economic Development Council for Business, with these open venues of closing down the street and having events. And I think between... As well as the DID, Downtown Improvement District Tax. Yes. Yeah, well, and applying that. I mean, Montpelier right. Live gets to apply that. And so always looking for improvements to how to increase people. It's people's presence out of their cars, downtown, interfacing, shopping, and experiencing positive events, whether that's cultural, singing, music. Um, I think just having that presence. What's the strength of Montpelier? You've lived here 51 years. <laughs> What, how is this different than it was 51 years ago that's a strength? Well, I was a Midwesterner. I came from southern Ohio. You can hear it sometimes in my words. And people didn't talk to strangers on the street. I mean, I embarrassed many people in the grocery store and just say hi to them or share, did you get this coupon? And, and I guess, What, were you wearing the Flatlanders <laughs> t-shirt or something? No, no, <laughs> because I was just speaking to strangers. And no, kidding, they didn't speak to strangers when I came here in the late 60s. It was a much more New England shutdown community. And I feel it's gotten more vibrant. People have gotten more involved, more extending, more diversified. I mean, the Black Lives Matter flag at the high uh, school. Could you explain the council resolution last night? Well, that's okay, but the Black Lives Matter flag at the high school to me is a huge... Uh, Wow, we are changing. Isn't this wonderful? I mean, we are not all Caucasians. We come from different cultures, different backgrounds, ethnic groups. I mean, there's so many ways in which America says we like diversity, but I'm now seeing it in Montpelier, but that means we're also challenged by it, and we're also ex experiencing, unfortunately, racism and inequality, and we need to work together. What was the resolution at council about? Well, the resolution, and I'm going to use some of the better chosen word, was a decision that we want to address counter racism and inequality, that we're going to be reaching out to the high school resources and the high school students who have a racial justice an uh, uh, mm, oh, alliance, racial justice alliance, and various, there's so many groups, a woman spoke last night, that are all trying to work in some way to help us understand our differences and respect them, that we really do live with a different reality, walking down the street, walking into a store, and hearing those stories. And the one piece that I shared last night that I would like to share here is a student gave a speech at Rotary on Monday about Black Life Matters, and she says, absolutely, all lives matter. But compare being one house on fire in a neighborhood. The ambulance goes to the house that needs them the most, that's having the biggest crisis. And what it does to save that household will benefit everyone to be safer and to be more inclusive. And so everything we do towards Black Lives Matters, every time we do, do towards reduce sexism, ageism, racism, 
helps everyone. And so that's the goal. But I want this council to be really active in it. I want it to make it one of our goals next year and to really work on a lot of community workshops, training, sensitivity. We don't have 30 minutes on this. <laughs> But no. what about ICE? What about immigration and undocumented people in our community and how our police relate to them? Uh, our police have such a commitment to treat everyone fairly, and that comes first. That we want people to go to the police when they need them and not worry about ICE. That's not our job. ICE being the immigration police. Yes. The immigration police, uh, that's a whole other uh, discussion, but for sure, our police and our city council and the statements from our own governor is very clear that we want to treat everyone equitably and fair. And when you need police, you need police. It's not about whether you've immigrated here or were born here, that you get the same services. The final question, why are you running again? All the meetings <laughs> and all the time commitment, I know they don't pay city well, council I, I people have, much. I must, why are you I running? I realize how much of an information junkie I am. I love having all this information. It takes a lot of time, not just the meetings, but you have to study a lot of documents and listen to testimony and various opinions. And I feel like I want to keep doing that because there's a lot dealing with safety, the, issue, the issues of not only safety from harm, but from harassment are very important to me. And that I want to work on how services can be more sustainable and so as we become more green, more energy aware, and trying to reduce that, trying to find alternatives that we can move towards a vision we want, but in a way that's reasonable within our limitations of our resources and that are sustainable. Donna, thank you very much for this discussion. <laughs> and welcome. you have heard Donna, as you can, I hope that you'll watch all of these and be able to hear everyone. I hope that you'll follow the school budget and the city budget because we have shows on both those. And I hope that you'll become informed. And what's most important, I hope you get out and vote on town meeting day and urge your family and friends to get out and vote. These are contested races in all three districts. I think yes. that's fantastic. I think it's. I think it would have been better had we had someone that run against Ann for mayor and yeah. hopefully that will happen next time. But get out there and vote on town meeting day become engaged, read the articles in the bridge, the profiles, and thank you very much for watching. Thank you, Richard.